Hello and welcome to Turning Point. My name is Mui Wan. It's a joy to be with you again. Coming up, a little girl's laughter turns into cries for help in the blink of an eye. And it's one of the most underreported crimes. Find out how you can help break the silence later in the program. But first, there was no hope for a small Nigerian boy, but in the midst of his mother's grief, something amazing happened, and Turning Point was right there in the middle of it all. Six-year-old Abraham was all his mother Angel had. Her husband left them when little Abraham was only three months old, but Angel's joy was tainted by fear because Abraham was always sick. I loved my son so much and did all I could to save him. He suffered from asthma since he was a baby. I worked very hard farming and doing domestic jobs just to pay his medical bills. One day he was very pale and barely breathing. By the time they came to the hospital, Abraham had asthma, tuberculosis and anemia. That day his temperature was low, his breathing was labored and his body was cold. I knew he would not survive. So I told them to go home. But Abraham never made it. He died on the way home from the hospital. When I discovered he was dead, I wanted to die myself. In their village, it's considered taboo to bury someone on a Friday. So Abraham's body was kept until the next day. As the mourners grieved, someone said they should call an evangelist who is supported by CBN. When the pastor arrived, he encouraged them and said they should believe in God. Then he said a prayer and played tapes of CBN shows. I assured them that a miracle would happen and Abraham would resurrect. But the villagers started hurling insults at me, saying, how can a person who died over 24 hours ago rise again? But I was encouraged that with God, all things were possible. As the crowd watched CBN's turning point, one of the hosts began to pray for miracles. At that moment, an amazing thing happened. We were all surprised to see the body move. Just when they were ready to take him away for burial, he came back to life. The people were shocked. Then he arose and we thanked God. It's no story, it happened. The boy was dead, but after 24 hours, he rose up again. Immediately, a great celebration broke out in the village. Because of that miracle, dozens of people gave their lives to Christ, including the doctor who had treated Abraham. I was an idol worshiper and never knew the power of God. But when I got to the village and heard about Abraham's miracle, I accepted Christ. Many of my doctor friends gave their lives to Christ too. When Abraham went back to the hospital, the doctor gave him a clean bill of health. He doesn't even have asthma anymore. Though he can hardly remember what it was like to be sick all the time, Abraham has vivid memories of the time he spent in heaven. I was at a place everyone there was glowing. We played a soccer game and I scored, so they said I should go back home. Thank God for CBN Africa. This miracle has truly changed our lives and the lives of others. Isn't that so amazing? Abraham was dead for more than 24 hours. But like the pastor said, with God, all things are possible. Miracles still happen today. They're not just a thing of the past. If you need one today, we pray that God will perform a miracle for you right now in the name of Jesus. Actually, let's pray together. Father, we come to you with confidence, knowing that miracles still happen today. As we've seen with the case of Abraham, you still do miracles. So Father, we ask that every impossible situation that someone is in right now, as they cry out to you, answer in the name of Jesus and turn it around. Show yourself to be God that's real, not just in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a moment to thank you for watching Turning Point. We always hope that you will experience something amazing and miraculous during the program. Know that God will do the same thing for you that he does for the people in the stories we bring. And speaking of miracles, that's exactly what the little girl in our next story needed when she went from playing to praying in a matter of seconds. 
The Popkoff children loved to play in the streets when it rained. That is, until a flash flood swept Elena into a drain pipe and out of their sight. I was on like a swimming tube. I just sat on it and the water just like kept carrying me until I got to the drain pipe. There was like no air in there. So like she couldn't, she had like no chances of breathing or anything. While the current pushed Elena farther and farther down the sewer line, one of the other children ran to the house to get mom. I couldn't believe it at first. I couldn't believe it. And I started praying right away. Like, God, please keep her alive. Please keep her alive. While struggling to surface, 11-year-old Elena remembered what her mother had taught her. From the beginning, I said, if, if you are alone by yourself and you're struggling, you can, you know, find a way out. Just pray God. He's there for you, you know. He's there listening to you. Jesus, help me. That's all I said in my head. And then seconds later, there was some sort of bright light, and somebody, it was like some sort of power was like just dragging me out of there by my arms. But I didn't feel any pain or anything. It, it was like my body was already on shore and somebody was just dragging my soul from there. Elena surfaced at a split in the pipe, two city blocks from her backyard. I don't really know how I got out, but I'm pretty sure that it was God. Neighborhood kids helped Elena to an ambulance. She had minor scratches and bruises, but amazingly, when doctors examined her at the hospital, they found no water in her lungs. I thought like it was a miracle that um, she got out and she lived through it and like, God was there the whole time. The entire family credits God for Elena's miraculous survival. I told my kids that life is born without God. If you live for Jesus, your life will be excited and full of miracles. He could do anything, even the impossible. Some people, they just think that there's no God, no hope, no nothing. But I know that there is a God and there is hope. You know, Elena remembered that her mother told her to pray, and she did. She asked Jesus to help, and he did. If you ask him, he would also rescue you, even when it looks like there's no way out. Just like Elena said, with God, there is hope. There's more for you on Turning Point after this. Would you be surprised if I told you that up to 36% of girls and 29% of boys have suffered child sexual abuse? At least that's what researchers think. But to be quite honest, it's hard to say exactly how many victims there are because most of the time abuse is not reported. But why is that? And what are the dangers of remaining silent? Holly Flood finds out. I want to talk to you today about not just about sexual, sexual abuse itself, but about the consequences and the issues that arise when sexual abuse goes unreported. Okay. As you know, sexual abuse obviously is on the rise um, around the world, but in certain places, people aren't reporting it um, mm -hmm. for various reasons. What do you think are the major consequences to not reporting sexual abuse, especially for the victim? I think that probably one of the number one consequences would be um, it causes it to um, continue um, because it, it's allowed to stay in the dark and to, to be a secret. And so then there's no way out, there's no avenue out for the victim. So it is, it's not uncommon though for, for victims to not report it, but it becomes more difficult if there's not an environment whereby it's okay to report it. Why do you think it's so common that it's not reported? It's one of the ways, for one, that a perpetrator, uh, it's one of the techniques that they use is to get the individual, to, the victim to not tell. Sometimes it's through threats, punishment. Um, they, they can threaten to kill someone or hurt a, a mom or a dad or someone that uh, that individual cares about, or even them. So the fear is, is a key factor. And also, uh, we call it clinically a power differential. If there's, um, if the person is older than the victim, things like that make a difference. 
And then um, in terms of the actual abuser, mm -hmm. what it, are there consequences that result from the fact that when it's unreported, obviously the um, abuser goes unpunished? I think that an abuser that goes unpunished is an empowered abuser. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the more that they have opportunity to do it, the more that they do that. And then, of course, the more dysfunctional they become. So I think being able to do it and get away with it is extremely empowering in a, a very negative way. A lot of times family members help empower those abusers. Mm -hmm. They don't report it for, you know, different reasons. Parents may know that their child was right. sexually abused. Why do you think they, they do that? I think there are a number of reasons. Um, specifically with, with moms, it's not uncommon for moms who have had the same experience and perhaps have never reported it to their own mom, or when they did report it, there was an unfavorable response. And so they just, people really do not know what to do when a child comes and say that they've been sexually abused or someone have touched them in the wrong way. Oftentimes people are uninformed or uneducated on how to respond to that. It's pretty overwhelming to hear that from a kid that you love and that you care about. Wow. Let's talk about then what they should actually do. We've talked about what the response usually is. What should family members be doing, let's say, if they know someone who's been a victim of sexual abuse? I think first and foremost, if a, if a kid comes to report that, the first thing to do is to believe mm -hmm. and to affirm them and to keep them, to get them in a safe place. That's essential. It takes tremendous courage to be able to disclose that. Oftentimes, they've been threatened, um, either that some harm would come to them or some harm would come to someone that they care about. And so by the time they get the courage to come to you, that in and of itself is an amazing act. And so then to not believe it is totally disempowering. And, and it, there's no other way for them to go but inward and oftentimes self-destruct, if you will. Now, in terms of society, there mm -hmm. are things that society can do to, to help prevent those issues. What could they be doing? Well, I think that um, the community at large, I think that the community has to have a problem with it. It's not, like you said, people often know or have some, some indication that something is happening, but they don't do anything, again, because they don't know what to do, um, because they don't want to get anybody else's business um, is another reason why people don't respond. But I think that um, there's a role for the government, but oftentimes the community or someone in the family has to make the government aware, either through you know, contacting a protective services or something like that. But oftentimes people just don't want to get involved, which is very problematic for kids. Yeah. There's one, one issue with society is that a lot of times in some, some places they view the, um, the victim more harshly than the actual abuser. Mm -hmm. And so w what, what can we say to, to just regular people in society in terms of that? How do we change that perception about who's actually the one at fault or wrong? Yeah. I think the people have to make a decision. I, I don't think it is a difficult thing to recognize that kids should not be abused. I think that it's a choice that people have to make. And so you have to ask yourself, what purpose is it serving that when kids tell us this, when victims come to us and say this has happened to them, that we have a problem with them as opposed to the perpetrator? There's, there's nothing um, scientific about you know, accepting reality that adults should not hurt children and that women shouldn't be raped. I mean, there's, there's nothing um, complex about accepting that reality. So I think one thing that has to be challenged in the society is what, is what purpose is this serving for us? Like why do we have a need for this to continue? What is that about? And I think that has to be just blasted right open. I think it requires a level of outrage, structured outrage. Amen to that. <laughs> now you mentioned the government a little while ago. Mm -hmm. What can governments do in terms of public policy? Sure to help with this issue? I think there are just um, basic laws that can be put into place. Like in the United States, there's certain people who are required to report, and then there are lines that are established for anybody to call and report if they believe something is happened to a, happening to a young person. So I think there's some infrastructure that needs to be there so that the government can investigate. But then the government also has to have a place of safety. Like you, you can't expect people to, young people to come out and say these things and then have to go and be in that same setting. That's, that's unrealistic and unfair. Do you think it's effective if, let's say, in, as part of that public policy, the government says, you know, if you know a child's been abused, but you don't report it, you should be punished as well. Should we go beyond just punishing the actual abuser? In the United States, there are already some practices in place if a child is being abused and perhaps a, a parent does not protect the child. It is identified as failure to protect. That is something that um, is often the reason why some kids get removed from parents if they're not being protected from some type of abuse. So I think that is one to. And it's been effective. Yes, I think so. I think it has been. But I think that in situations where the community condones the behavior, it, it has to be much stronger than that. I think that it may have to go beyond the parent. 
What, let's say we have someone watching today, a mm -hmm. young, young girl or young boy who's been a victim of, of sexual abuse. What is it that you would say to them? What would be your best advice to them? First, I would want to say to them that they have done nothing wrong. That is not their fault. And I would say that they need to identify somebody that they can trust, you know, who they feel safe with. And only they know what's safe. Like, nobody can just say to them, you need to go and tell somebody right now, because they know the, the consequences of what may happen in their particular situation. But I think identifying someone that they can trust and somebody that can keep them safe, I think that would be really, really important. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm a, I'm a woman of strong faith, so I do believe um, praying about it is essential and, and trusting God to show them and not losing faith in God mm -hmm. in the midst of it. That's essential. I was a victim of sexual abuse as a young person, and I met Christ before that happened to me. And so it was interesting to try to understand why I was experiencing that. But as I got older, it certainly has, um, I, I, it's, I've put it in perspective. But I think that it's, it challenges your faith if you have one. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, it makes it difficult to acquire one. Wow. Okay, well, thank you so much for those words of wisdom. And um, again, we're, we're so glad you've joined us today. We hope you'll come back Absolutely. and talk with us again. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you. If you or someone you know is a victim of sexual abuse, please, please break the silence and speak to someone you trust. If you're someone who has abused, God is ready to forgive if you repent. Jesus wants to forgive and give a new beginning. We want to be a part of that new beginning. You can contact us if you need to talk to someone when you find out how during the break. Welcome back. Mary DeMuth just wanted to be loved. Instead, she was neglected and abused. And to top it all off, the people who pretended to be her friends were the very ones hurting her the most. I grew up in a pretty unsafe home where there was drugs and wild parties, and it was scary to me. All I really wanted was to be safe. All I really wanted was to be taken care of. All I really wanted was to be loved. Mary DeMuth felt the sting of loneliness as a little girl. She fended for herself while her mother and stepfather were preoccupied with their own lives, partying frequently. She was farmed out to a babysitter who cared nothing about her safety. And I would go to my babysitter's house and these neighborhood boys who were probably 13 and 16, they were brothers, would come to the house every day and they would ask if they could um, take me out to play. And my babysitter just did not really want to be bothered with having to take care of me. And so she said, sure, go ahead. And so they would take me anywhere where I wouldn't be seen or heard. Uh, they took me to their bedroom and their bunk bed when their mother was making cookies and they would rape me over and over again and they would take me to deep ravines in the woods. When that was happening, I would just kind of escape in my mind. I would look up at the trees and I would see the limbs and I would just watch the limbs. I would just look at them sway above me and it was my way of kind of disconnecting. The abuse went on for months. But one day when the boys started bringing their friends to join in with what they were doing, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't have more people come and be a part of this uh, molestation, this sexual abuse. Mary gathered up the courage to tell her babysitter. And so I fully believed that the babysitter would tell my mother. And the next day there was a knock on the door again. And the boys were there and they took me out. And the next day they came again. And the next day they came again. Until Mary found an escape at the babysitter's house. I would sleep and pretend to sleep for hours and hours and hours and the boys would come and knock and for some reason when I was sleeping, uh, she didn't make me wake up. After Mary finished kindergarten, she never saw her abusers again. The abuse stopped, thankfully, because we moved far, far away and they couldn't get me anymore. But the emotional torment caused by the abuse followed her for years. Then came the news of her biological father's sudden death. Mary was devastated. 
My father was my hero, but I only saw him every other weekend for a day or two. And so when he died, something died in me. Sometimes I would pray, even though I didn't really even know who God was. I just had so much grief, I didn't know what to do with it. And so at that point, I thought, what in the world am I doing on this earth? Why am I even here? What's the point? She penned a suicide poem, but she never followed through with it. I was in a desperate state, and I, I started to make more friends, thankfully, during this time. And one of my good friends invited me to Young Life, which is a ministry to high school kids. At the weekend camp, I heard everything that you need to know about Jesus and more. Life, death, resurrection. As I heard the story about Jesus and how he died on the cross for me, I knew that he was the one who would never leave me. I had such an insatiable need for Jesus. It was as if I was dying of thirst and he was that glass of water that I needed to live. I looked up into that sky underneath that tree. I remember the bark against my backbone. I said to Jesus, I'm a mess. I hope you don't regret this. Please take me, please take me. And he met me in that moment and his presence was there. And I knew I would never be the same, that my life was completely changed, that um, all that abandonment and pain and strife was gone. Mary says Jesus began to heal her emotional wounds and her relationship with her mom. Once I met Jesus, I was kind of on a truth hunt. Jesus was the truth and had set me free, but um, I wanted to know more of the truth. And I wanted to know if my mom knew about that, the rapes that happened to me when I was little. And then she said to me, I didn't know, the babysitter never told me. So that really did help heal a part of our relationship. The healing continued in college. God surrounded Mary with Christian friends. So they spent those four years just laying hands on me and praying for me, letting me cry when I needed to cry. All that healing just came, you know, at the other end of their hands and their prayers. And that's just the power of God healing. Mary says through Christ, she was able to forgive the boys who molested her. I just breathed a prayer and just said, Lord, I, I forgive them, bless their lives. I pray that the abuse that they gave me wouldn't inform the rest of their lives. I pray they bring it out into the open. I pray that they would be set free. And something in me broke then, just this ability to pray for those who had done that to me. Now a wife, a mother, and an author, Mary invites her readers on a journey to discover the love, freedom, and eternal life found in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel, transform lives, that God will reach down from heaven, pull us out of the pit, set our feet on a rock, and make our footsteps firm. That's what God does for us. He is capable of turning whatever trial that you've been to into some sort of triumph for His glory alone. You know, Mary was courageous enough to cry out for help, but her babysitter didn't help. There was someone who did. His name is Jesus. Listen to what Psalm 40 says. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on the ground and steadied me along my way. He's given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They'll put their trust in the Lord. What the Lord did for Mary was amazing. He stepped in and changed Mary's life when no one else could, and he could do the same for you. If, like Mary, you've been neglected and abused, and the pain is more than you can bear, please contact us. We want to help. During the break, you'll find out how. You know, we're out of time again, but I hope you've been inspired to believe in miracles and encouraged to take a stand against sexual abuse. Visit our website for more stories, turningpointzone.com. You'll be encouraged. Leave you in an artist we met in Kenya not so long ago. Her name is Ramsila, and her song, This Ain't It. See you soon. I've been deceived too long.
that all is okay Whoa. I've been down so low that I thought it's okay Whoa. Till the day that I realized I can have all the Bible tales And I found my identity In what my father said And wants the best for me That's when I saw the light and said When I realized that this felt out war, are you tired of being dead? For the armor of the Lord, we are now in a battlefield. Everybody shout aloud and say. 